Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Here's a problem most of us never have. So many people want to date you and send you baked goods that you actually have to turn them away. Well, that did not happen to Amy Cohen, but it did happen to her father. And Amy writes about the difference between her father's dating life and her own in the essay, Ah, to be old, male, and single. It's read by Natasha Lyonne. She's the star and co-creator of the Netflix series Russian Doll. Manhattan may have a scarcity of affordable apartments and parking spaces, but apparently it has no shortage of older widows and comely divorcees, many of whom wanted to date my newly widowed father. Whenever I visited him at his Upper East Side apartment, it was not uncommon for us to be interrupted by the doorman calling up to say, A lady just left a bunt cake downstairs. What am I supposed to do with all these women, he would say. I feel bad, but there are just too many. To adjust to his new social life, my 76-year-old father, whose old clothes were stained with Bloody Mary mix from his evening cocktails, purchased a new wardrobe of bright crewneck sweaters and khakis. His dates often sported silky hair teased into virtual pillbox hats. They were all very nice and charitably active, but as my father would say after each one, she's no mom. My friends and I marveled at his social schedule. Can you believe it? I said to my best friend. It's his fourth date this week. We all need to be reincarnated as an older Jewish man with an apartment on the Upper East Side. Exactly, she said. No one's leaving bunk cakes in my lobby. Aim, my father would explain. These ladies are just so relieved I can remember their names. I get bonus points for just being able to walk to the restaurant without an attendant. I was 35 and recently had been dumped by the man I had hoped to marry. So when my father wasn't taking a divorcee to a movie or escorting somebody's great-grandmother to a Haydn concert, he frequently could be found with me, his lonely daughter. In fact, he and I now spent so much time together that when people asked if I was dating again, I often would answer, apparently, I'm dating my father. All my life, he and I had been distant, not just emotionally, but physically. He traveled around the world for work and during my childhood was often away for months at a time. When he returned, I would jump up and down, trying to get his attention, presenting him with books I'd written with titles like, Look, look, I'm over here, and my name is Amy, illustrated with drawings of me. Now... With both of us single, we finally were close. And even though I understood that my father needed someone, when my mother first became sick, he didn't even know how to order Chinese food by phone or scramble an egg, I found myself growing nervous about the prospect of losing him again. Yet I knew he'd be happier with a new love in his life. So I cheered him on just as he did with me. Do you like her? I'd ask eagerly after a date. Will you take her out again? I don't know. She's a nice lady, but we've only been out twice, and she's asking me if I want to escort her to her nephew's bar mitzvah. While we're on the subject, isn't it time you started dating again? I'm not ready, 
She's not ready, he shook his head. You're a beautiful, intelligent young lady. Get out of the house. Because if you don't, it becomes a kind of a syndrome, don't you think? A syndrome? This reminded me of the time he told me that if I didn't clean out the cat litter, the fumes could make me go blind. Like an obsessive thing, he said. It's time. I'll think about it. But the fact that I wasn't ready didn't stop well-meaning friends and family from trying to set me up. One day, my sister called after dropping her son at tennis camp to tell me she had good news. A friend's brother worked with a guy whose wife knew someone who said he would go out on a blind date with me. Wasn't that great? Fine, I said. I'll go. Really? Yeah, whatever. The next time I visited my father, he just stared at me, beaming, until he couldn't hold it any longer. Your sister told me you have a date, he said. Word travels fast, I said. Yes, next Monday. The eagle has landed. Dad, it's just a dinner. But don't you see, he said. One date will lead to another and another. He assumed that because he was being pursued by hordes of eligible women, I would be pursued by hordes of eligible men. But the hordes remained in pursuit of him alone. Not long after, he and I attended a lecture given at a community center on the Upper East Side. The crowd, thick and slow-moving, was composed mostly of men and women wearing wool sweaters in 80-degree weather. For the over-65 crowd, this was the equivalent of Woodstock. And while there wasn't free love, there was free food, which had caused our exit to be clogged by people stuffing sandwich cookies into their bags and downing free grape juice. This is why we were at a standstill when we heard someone yell, Mary! from across the room. We turned to see an elderly woman moving toward us, each step followed by a brief but noticeable pause. She wore an elegant red suit woven with gold thread and had calves so thin they looked as if broom handles were rising out of her suede tip Ferragamo shoes. Hello, Mary, she said in a throaty voice. By the way she was straining to maintain her composure, I could tell that she had gone on a date with my father and that he had never called her again. I knew this look myself, the look that said, I'm devastated, but I'm going to pretend not to care that you didn't want me. As she stared at him, eyes pleading, I could tell she was hoping he would give her another shot. My father called out her name, and from the way he said it, warmly but without passion, I knew she didn't have a chance. I felt for her. She had done all the right things, married the right person. Also, this would never happen. And even though this woman and I were 40 years apart, biology had rendered us equally vulnerable. It had left her a widow, as it had so many women her age, and it had left me anxious to meet someone, as I hoped to have a baby within the next few years. I assumed that as a teenager, she thought, as I once had, that she held the upper hand. And now we were reduced to this, feeling afraid and bewildered, wondering whether to blame the stars or ourselves. She seemed nice, I said as we left. Hey, are you sure you don't want to go out with her again? Aim, she's lovely. Just a lovely, lovely lady, but not for me. I think you should give her a chance, I said, and... As I did, I realized in some magical way I was hoping that if I could persuade him to give her another chance, uh, I might get one myself. 
Just thinking about this made me annoyed at my father. All you care about is looks, I said. He shrugged. Hey, I didn't choose this. I'd rather have mom. You don't want me to be alone for the rest of my life, do you? I didn't. I didn't want either of us to be alone for the rest of our lives. But things seemed to be considerably more promising for him than for me. Among my recent dates was a guy who told me, I haven't had sex in six weeks and it's making me really edgy. A man who pretended to be blind so he could take his dog onto the subway. And an investment banker who asked me over dinner how many men I had slept with and if I owned a vibrator. At least I still had my father. Or so I thought. Until a phone call from my sister, who, after apologizing for giving some guy my phone number without telling me, asked out of the blue, So, what do you think about Dad's girlfriend? I swallowed. His girlfriend? I knew sooner or later this day would come. But now that it had, I felt suddenly abandoned, as if he had moved without leaving a forwarding address. He didn't tell you he has a girlfriend, my sister said. You two spend so much time together. Yeah, well, uh, he told me he's been on a few dates with this one woman, but no, he didn't call her his girlfriend. I said this with a pronounced casualness, but in truth, I was hurt. Why hadn't he confided in me? My sister made a sound, not quite a laugh. It's so funny. Ever since your big breakup, he's been saying to me, I hope Amy meets someone first. I hope she meets someone first. Maybe that's why he didn't tell you. Maybe, I said. The next day, I met my father at Saks to help him shop for a new suit. What's wrong, he asked. You seem upset about something. My mind was racing. Nothing! Trying to make conversation, I told him about the guy who asked me if I had a vibrator. I said if he wanted a vibrator so much, he should get his own. Well, I think you should have stood up, grabbed your coat, and said, You may talk to other young women that way, but I don't care for that sort of behavior. Good night, sir. Apparently, my father thought my date took place in 1953. What I'm telling you, he went on, is you can't let that happen because you need someone who's going to be good to you and take care of you. You haven't had such an easy time lately, but remember, any young man would be very fortunate to get you. Don't forget that, okay? Okay, I said but I couldn't get the idea of his new girlfriend out of my mind. <sighs> Before my mother died, she told me she wanted me to welcome whoever my father found into our family. Little did she know that in her absence, my father and I would instead find each other. Although I felt lucky about our new relationship, I also felt guilty that we'd grown close only because she died. Then it occurred to me, maybe that's how my father felt about finding someone first. Lucky, but guilty. I wanted to tell him that it was all right, that he didn't have to worry about me or feel guilty that maybe one day I would meet somebody's second cousin twice removed, or maybe not. The point was, I felt happy for him, whether we were able to keep what we had or not. And as it turned out, my father was able to stick by both of us, his new girlfriend and me. Now, years later, she and I trade recipes for butt cake. Natasha Leone reading Amy Cohen's essay, Ah, To Be Old, Male, and Single. We'll catch up with Amy after the break.
Amy Cohen's essay came out 12 years ago. This past summer, her father passed away. He had had really pretty serious dementia for the last year of his life. And I think that um, it was interesting because I think dementia simplifies people sometimes. And so he was just reduced to like his sweetest, most loving self. It was a different relationship than they'd had when Amy was growing up. Back then, she felt criticized by her dad. He would say, like, you know, you're so incredible. If you would only fix your hair and maybe, you know, like, calm down a little bit, you know, I would call it the compla insult because it was a compliment used with, like, an insult chaser. You know, the decline probably happened over a good three years. Um, But the last year in particular, you know, he was kind of losing everything. He couldn't really see, he couldn't really hear. You know, I was just happy to um, to be there for him, you know, to let him know how loved he was. I think um, I kind of came to understand him in a new way. Amy's father and his girlfriend stayed together for years before their relationship ended. But Amy didn't find the partner that she'd been looking for. Instead, she had two children on her own. She made that decision after finding out that her sister had stage four breast cancer. I kind of, you know, wrapped my head around the fact that I was losing my best friend and someone I absolutely adored and looked up to in every way. And when I kind of processed that a little bit more and realized that she just wanted to live her life and I decided I was going to be a mom (laughs) because I felt like you can't wait. You just can't wait. You just have to do it. And it's, you know, it had been something that scared me for years And I wish I had known how much stronger I was than I realized. Amy says her father was with her for every sonogram. And when she gave birth to both her children, he was there too. Sort of. I was in labor for like 36 hours. And, you know, again, he was like, I'm not going to stay here 36 hours. I'm hungry. I'm going to go to a restaurant. If you give birth, call me, but I'm not going to stay here because I have other things to do. That was very much my daddy. And so he actually, they came back from dinner 10 minutes before I gave birth. I ended up having a C-section and he just like waltzed in, you know, like after having like a nice veal piccata, came in. There I was with his new grandchild. Amy's children are eight and three years old now. She says that raising them on her own has showed her how strong she is. And though her life now is hectic and crazy, she wouldn't have it any other way. People are trying to fix me up now. I have no interest. I have no interest. One day I might. You know, as I said, I'm really tired. Our house is so messy. I, I'm just kind of like barely getting through but I don't really have an, a desire to meet anyone right now, which is pretty incredible considering how much time I devoted to it for so long and how much it was so ingrained in me that that was the biggest deciding factor of your worth. You know, do you have anyone? Is there someone who is standing there saying that they've chosen you? Um, no. <laughs> no one. No one chose me, and I'm fine. Fine, fine, fine. That's Amy Cohen. She's the author of The Late Bloomer's Revolution, and she lives with her daughters in New York. We asked Amy Cohen how she felt about Natasha Lyonne choosing her piece to read on the podcast. And she told us that when we reached out to her, she was in the middle of binge-watching Natasha's new show, Russian Doll. Amy says it helped her get through some of the grief around her father's dementia and death. I think I felt like I said goodbye to him when he kind of stopped knowing really who I was or what was going on. And so when he died in June, I felt like, oh, I guess I already grieved. And then in January, I started to think like, I don't think I grieve for my dad. Like, I think I thought I had and I hadn't. And I started having a really hard time. And so February 1st, when Russian Doll came out, I was not sleeping at night. And I thought, oh my gosh, Russian Doll, my favorite actress, Natasha Lyonne, I'm going to watch it. And then I could not stop 
watching it. It was so many things that I've been thinking about. It was grief. It was the complicated relationship people have with their parents. There was something about it that completely obsessed me. Natasha says she connected with Amy's story, too. It's very funny. You know, this one has really great uh, comedic rhythms. Um, and, you know, uh, it also did not have a risk of me sounding too Jewy, which is a uh, uh, an, uh, accidental fallback place I go to as a result of being raised on the Upper East Side and attending yeshiva, I'm afraid. So there's no hiding it. And sometimes I read like my old rabbis. Uh, so she is a wonderful, wonderful writer is the point of what I'm trying to say. And it's an honor to read her piece. Thanks again to Natasha for reading this week's piece. You can watch Russian Doll now on Netflix. And here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. I'm always so interested in you know, what happens when, when one of our parents dies or there's divorce or there's any of those things where our parents end up single and dating? And there's some horrible stories that I hear all the time of how children disapprove. You know, they, it doesn't matter how in love their father is or their mother is with someone, some stranger, um, the children disapprove, you know, and that's not mom and that's not dad. And how dare you? And what, one thing that I just love about Amy's piece is how they... They sort of bond over being single together and trying to find someone together. But they're just so, they're so lovely together, and he's so funny, and they cheerlead for each other. And I, I don't know, I mean, a sense of humor can rescue almost any dire situation, and Amy brings all the humor to this one, and I think it's just really a sweet, sweet piece. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Special thanks to Samantha Hennig, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at The New York Times. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Additional music courtesy of APM. Ah, To Be Old, Male, and Single by Amy Cohen is adapted from Amy's book, The Late Bloomer's Revolution. Check it out. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.